Welcome to Kotwadar and IR 4.0 Corporate Media House. And today we are going to discuss one of the key challenges that even global giant IT organization faces, which is technical sales and how they map their customer success journey towards a better value creation. To answer our questions, we have with us Ms. Shalaka Verma, who's the Director of Customer Success in the BFSI domain at Microsoft. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you for having me here, Tanya. Yeah, so I really want to understand that you have given a great emphasis on uh, leveraging the tech innovation that drives businesses for clients in various areas, such as client management, employee management. Can you share certain strategies with us that you have implemented successfully to bridge the gap between technology innovation and tangible business outcomes? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's that's been the forte of the career uh, in the first place, right? How do you bridge the gap between uh, tech as an enabler and how do you attach it to a business outcome? Uh, but having said that, you know, a uh, lot of times, especially in, in the two areas that you called out, uh, the customer enablement and employee experience, uh, measurement is very fluid uh, and it changes based on the customer and how do they see their engagement KPI and their employee experience, how do they measure? Uh, and hence, I think this particular field is a bit, uh, I would say, tricky. Um, you know, one of, it's like art. Um, uh, one of the, one of our own customer had explained it in this way uh, some time back to me and I found this very uh, uh, insightful uh, is about a painting, right? He said, if you appreciate a painting, uh, you don't need numbers to prove the beauty. Uh, and if you don't, then no matter what kind of numbers you bring it, you probably are not going to make a lot of sense. Uh, and that's really what experience is about. Right? It's very difficult to catch in numbers. But having said that, I would say there were a lot of phenomenal stuff that the, that the team has really done over the year. Uh, I'll probably bring up a couple of examples. One was that we did for one of our retail customer uh, where they had uh, this branch retail outlets uh, and MBO outlets. Uh, so two problems they have, right? One is, are you following all your compliance and uh, company-specific guidelines and processes at the opening and the closing of the store? Uh, and through the day, whenever a challenge comes in, are you sort of documenting and communicating that back to a supervisor or your company headquarter uh, so that it gets converted into an actionable insight. Um, we, the, the team really uh, uh, went ahead and built a very insightful app uh, for those frontline people. Uh, and it's really solved two, three problems for this company in one shot, right? One was they were able to get a very comprehensive documented view of their store opening and close processes and hence build the confidence in terms of the experience that they are offering to the customer is reputable uh, and uniform across the branches. Um, and they could have uh, evidence to sort of back up those claims. Second one, one was it was very easy for the front line uh, to not get lost into a lot of directive emails and trying to keep up with them in terms of what they're supposed to do, but more like an app on the mobile, which everyone is now used to, to go through that checklist and just say, go, no, go, yes, no, and sort of be done with what they were supposed to do as a process. Uh, and the third one was really the churn problem, right? If, if people leave uh, and new people join in, uh, just training them to get ramped up on what is required takes a lot of time. But you know, the younger generation, they are so tech savvy that if you give them an app and say, follow this, it's very easy uh, for them to sort of get ramped up themselves. Uh, and hence, that really made a lot of difference uh, in the way uh, where eventually not just customers benefited in terms of the experience that they were getting, but also the employees or the frontline got empowered uh, to, to do certain things in a way that suits them the best. Uh, and at the same time, it's very empowering uh, in terms of how they are collaborating across, right? So those that was one insight that I had. One of the second example I could give you is one of the airline customer where uh, it was very specific to their crew, uh, which was in-flight crew, and how were they communicating to the supervisors in the offices? 
and the crew is generally always on the go, right? So it's very difficult for for you to find time face to face, one on one. So you know, enabling this via again a front line enabling uh, applications which is integrated into Microsoft Teams right now. But the idea was to really bring their entire supervision and the audit and the crew communication onto a uniform platform. And then in the process, really activate a lot of mechanisms like, can we record the one-on-one -on -one conversation? Can the feedback be a lot more qualitative? Can we create a governance on top of the supervisors themselves so that they are better coach over the period of time? And then we started bringing in a lot of these daily apps uh, that the crew uses. Uh, it may be as, uh, as trivial as their leave application app, or as important as their in-flight checklist app, but bring everything into a standard interface. Uh, also, a lot of learnings for the frontline, like the guidelines keep changing, the compliance keeps changing. There are a lot of reminders on how should they treat their employees, how should they treat their peer community, how should they treat their customers, and so on and so forth. All of that, we could just make it enabled via this tech platform so that we are not dependent on people finding a time in the office or uh, time at their desks to really go through and complete this. They could just do it while they are traveling, they are on car, they are, you know, you know it just sort of creates a lot of velocity in the way people can get the stuff done. Uh, and that is very, very empowering for people in the field. Uh, because one thing that they really like is time. Uh, and so uh, anything that you could just sort of uh, empower them to save more in terms of time, I think that helps them a lot and that helps uh, also customers a lot uh, whom they ultimately serve. So those two examples come to my mind. Uh, I'll take a pause here, Tanya. Right. So uh, that are just great examples that you have created massive value for your customers. Uh, coming to the next one, like you have a great experience with Azure computing adoptions that are being going on at Microsoft. Can you provide certain insights and challenges uh, that you have faced while driving quantum computing initiatives uh, within Microsoft partner ecosystem? And how do you see quantum computing shaping the future of uh, technology solution? So uh, quantum is anyway a very, very niche area. Um, and I do it out of sheer passion that I have for this uh, field. Uh, we are not at a stage where things are going, things are really streamlined. This is not really a at scale sales motion uh, from the OEM perspective, right? Uh, so the challenges are abundant, but every challenge in quantum computing is a massive, massive opportunity. And hence uh, trying to make a dent there right in the start at the nascent stage of this field is just so much empowering and uh, satisfying and rewarding, I would say, uh, that none of this feels like a problem. Um, but the, the potential of the field is massive. It really solves a bunch of the problems that are considered intractable in the current classical computing. Um, and every every problem that a quantum computing potentially can solve has massive impact on humanity uh, in terms of how we approach our sustainability, how are we looking at feeding the population, how are we looking at creating the net new drugs uh, that will eventually help us improve our healthcare tremendously. How are we thinking about our manufacturing processes? How are we thinking about our financials, uh, fraud detections, or even our uh, share uh, market investing and so on and so forth, right? So it just has this huge potential to impact everything. And yet it is not at a stage where it can really do so. Uh, and that's really the challenge of, you know, how do you keep the excitement going? How do you bring a lot of people together to contribute to the potential that it is uh, so that eventually we realize the dream. I'm sure it's the next future that we are going to see in the next decades. So coming to the technology sales uh, part, you have a great experience in technology sales. And I just want to understand how you bring certain strategies on the table while you were working at IBM. So uh, what are the fundamental principles that you follow approaching transformational projects and how do you ensure they align with the organization goals as well? So transformation can happen two ways uh, in my mind, right? Uh, and a lot of transformations, the pivoting point really is the innovation. 
when I say two ways, it start it can start from it can start from getting inspired by something. And in my case, most of the times that inspired is tech, something in the tech domain. But there are multiple levels people may have when they get inspired by something. Uh, and yeah, you get inspired by something. Uh, you think about what is possible with the new piece of information, tool, gadget that has come to your hand. And then you try and create a bunch of use cases based, off, based to your knowledge and say, here is what can change in the world around me with what I have just learned or just figured out and just say has come on the block. Quantum is really a good example of that, right? Now that it's here, what's possible? And that's one way of transforming. The other way of transforming is the other side down, other way down, right? You look at a problem. You, you are in your day-to-day -day life. You look at a problem and you really start questioning the status quo and you ask, why? Why is it like this? What if? What can change? Uh, what are those underlying assumptions that we are not questioning at this point? And then you start questioning them and start debunking some of the myths that have gone, uh, probably gone ingrained into the system over a period of time because they were true at some point. And then you start breaking them down and taking them away so that your process or the problem at hand really becomes a smaller or a more reconcilable problem that can move forward or can be reimagined. So there are two ways to approach transformation in my mind. Both ways work. Uh, for both the sides, there is tremendous work required on uh, eventually getting funds from somebody. Uh, as at some point, this is customer. some point, this is internal to the organization that we work with. Uh, but yeah, any work uh, will require some funds to come from somebody. But the moment you get inspired and you figure out what you want to do with it, uh, I think you you really figure out who will have the largest stake uh, to invest in the work that needs to happen. Uh, and once you find that, I think you are aligned in terms of uh, really getting that goal. Now, the trick is to really get there. So the execution is really the trick uh, because you could sort of just make a good plan of transformation. Um, and if it doesn't really materialize, then yeah, you lose the credibility and it just keeps becoming harder and harder the next time. So success is, is really pivotal uh, on the transforming projects. Um, but it's not really going to have a 100% hit ratio. So, you know, you will have to balance this out uh, over a period of time in terms of the bets that you are taking versus uh, the results that you will deliver. So that's, that's how uh, I look at uh, overall approach through the transformation. So uh, your track record really reveals that uh, you serve the project that is first of its kind in across platforms and domains that you have worked across. So could you drive uh, into a deeper win that has a specific problem you address in terms of the innovative solutions? You have already given ample examples, but really would like to know another one that has impacted the client and the organization. Yeah, so um, I will probably draw from um, one of the examples that uh, I actually had very early in my career. And I am going back to that example because uh, it sort of paved the way for me in terms of how am I thinking about uh, problems that happen uh, on the day-to-day -day life, right? Uh, and very early in my career, I was working for Biobatomic Research Center. And one of the problems that we were grappling at that point was how do I get our parallel cluster build up like we were working on developing a parallel computer in Baba Atomic Research Center at that point and uh, one of the ch challenge was how do you make a new machine up in a short period of time um, and at that point our entire deployment timeline for about 200-300 machines was six weeks seven weeks because we were going very serially and you know, trying to um, harden the OS and, and stuff like that and then bring uh, the customized configurations that you need to do. Uh, and my mentor really encouraged me to look at this as a problem statement and said, this is intractable because as we grow uh, over a period of time, next 30, 40 years, the size of these machines are just going to grow. Uh, and the way we are approaching the current deployment is not really a scalable model. And can we look at 
some of the automations early in. And at that point, it looked like a humongous task to go and pick up the operating systems, look at their kernels, change something, be not very confident about the change because you were never really massively uh, worked on an operating system kernel changes and so on and so forth. But still experiment, get this done. And then it really helps to work with masters, I would say, people who are very, very proficient in what they do. So uh, my reporting manager at that point, I was very lucky to have him who was very good at looking at optimizing the code base. And uh, he was just used to send me back and, you know, go redo, redo. And eventually we uh, got to a state where uh, we could bring our new machine up in half a day versus those uh, six weeks that we were talking about. And uh, that was an aha moment. Uh, it was it was not comfortable. Uh, we were not very sure about what if it doesn't work. Uh, I didn't also know, you know, um, how stable this is and whether something else is not breaking up and so on and so forth. But it worked fine. Um, and it gave us a lot of free bandwidth to do a lot other innovative stuff, I would say. And that's the key about innovation. If you have got people with energy on the team and if you're able to optimize and take something off, they are very much capable of filling the plate with something a lot more transformative. And that's really the fun of moving the whole thing forward. But what I also learned in that was if the goal is inspirational enough, you will find the appetite to take the risk in yourself, right? And that also helped me a lot through the entire career. And whenever I have done a first of a kind project with the customer, I, I think that I'm always successful when I am able to find a similar stakeholder on the other side of the fence, a person who, who is inspired uh, on what is so much on what is possible, that they are willing to take the risk of failing somewhere down the path, but still have uh, enough insight and enough motivation to keep going till that goal is achieved. So I think that's really the uh, energy that helps you in almost every first of a kind project. You have to enter with a mindset that there is a real possibility that this will fail and you still need people who want to give their best shot at it because the end outcome is so inspirational to them. I think uh, execution man just keeping uh, the spirit of going on, going on is the uh, uh, word here, value here. Uh, really would like to understand that uh, in the enterprise-wide transformation solutions in AI infrastructure, data, and information architecture, it really requires deep understanding of the technology. Uh, can you provide an example that was uh, really complex uh, in the domain and how you approach the design and implementation processes for enterprises? Yeah, sure. So I am right now at a stage in the career where I am necessarily not the SME or the deep expert um, on anything that I right now look at, uh, honestly. Um, and so for me, the trick is really going to be about having the right people on the team. There was a time, I think about 10 years back, when I was um, an individual contributor, uh, was considered an expert in a field. Uh, and that time, I used to really take a lot of pride in bringing that excellence and credibility to the job that I do, right? Um, and I, I have had amazing wins, uh, I think, with IBM, uh, with the, mobile, the startup that I used to work with, Mobilium, and so on and so forth, um, which were sheer, you know, the high is really about me delivering something on a technology front with an excellence that matters. Uh, but like last 10, 15 years, career has taken a shape where my reliance on somebody doing that uh, is far higher, uh, I would say. Uh, and the excellence that I drive from myself is really my ability uh, 
to give them that kind of credibility and make, make build a team uh, that pivots on excellence, innovation, and growth mindset every day, right? So that, that's how I would really look at uh, how what how I empower people uh, now. And if you empower them, they do brilliant stuff, right? I mean, it's it's that's the power of uh, technical acumen or the brain, uh, which is very diverse. Uh, and those people are generally go-getters. Uh, and so if you are really able to make the culture uh, in a way where people are collaborating, always collaborating with each other, uh, always bouncing off ideas, learning from each other, and constantly learning themselves. And raising the bar for themselves i think good things happen uh, on the field uh, anyway we really want to understand you have a huge experience in r and d leadership and including filing patents which is a noteworthy task so what advice would you give to individuals in organizations who are actually looking to foster culture of innovation and right technology for their past yeah no i think just just be at it is my advice, really. Uh, never lose uh, the energy, never lose the passion for what you do. Uh, I know it sounds very cliche, but but that's really the truth. Uh, if you like what you do, I think you will do it way better. Uh, and if you do it way better, you will do groundbreaking stuff uh, in anything that you do. Uh, and so that's really going to be the advice. Uh, but for especially on the innovation side, I think the the larger point that I would drive is the power of uh, uh, innovators DNA. It's, there was a beautiful article written by HBR a uh, few years back that has stayed with me so far, right? They, they called it as innovators DNA. And it really pivots on few things. One is your ability to ask right questions. Uh, and this is something that I alluded to at the start of the interview, right? The transformation can happen both of the ways. One way is to question the status quo, your ability to ask the right questions on why certain things are the way they are is where you will find the opportunity to innovate. That, that's the first thing uh, that we should remember. The second one is your power of association. Are you able to pick up an idea from one domain and associate with a similar pattern that is happening in other domain. And that is across tech. It's not really about tech, but it's across businesses. Like, are you looking at a way the share market optimizes a portfolio? And then can you look at the supply chain, how they try to optimize the route? And can you find the similarity, right? Those are associators' uh, DNAs. But again, they happen when you are present in the moment and looking at a problem with a lens that will help you extract patterns uh, and the, your extraction of patterns gives you a broader opportunity to innovate because what you learn in one field, you can apply in another field. Uh, the third one really is about your networks. Uh, the more diverse people you talk to, uh, the more you have opportunity to innovate uh, and bring those ideas and integrate them into the work. And then the question is, why should diverse people talk to you? Uh, and hence, you have to really embody that diversity yourself. So always be intentional about what is that you are giving into a conversation. Uh, and then in return, uh, how are you building that trust? And how are you building that culture of sharing uh, knowledge together? And again, be practice the active listening, right? If you listen to people who are different from yourself, you have a good shot at assimilating more diverse kind of information and say, bring something or do something out of that. So I think those are some of the pillars of how I think innovation comes to uh, life. Uh, these are all soft skills according to me rather than really hardcore technical skills. If you're good at technologies and if you practice this, you'll figure out something 